Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Bartlett, and welcome to the New York Society Library. Many of you are familiar faces. Uh, some of you are not. It's great to have you all here on a very special Saturday afternoon at the library for what will be, I think, a, a truly memorable uh, performance. I'm so glad that you could be with us this afternoon, and uh, we're going to be having a great program called Mingling with the Old Time Throng, Love Songs for New York. Before we introduce our speakers and our performers, I want to remind everyone, if any of you have one, uh, please silence your cell phones and any electronic devices. We do actually record our events now, so uh, if there are no so cell phones, we actually love that as well. And when one goes off, I get very cranky. <laughs> The library does rely on the support of our donors to help make special afternoons like this possible. I want to thank all of you who did uh, help us last year with our annual appeal, and I do encourage those of you who uh, support us to continue to do so this year. It does make events like this afternoon possible. Our speaker this afternoon is Michael Lasser, author of America's Songs, the stories behind the songs of Broadway, Hollywood, and Tin Pan Alley. He's very well known as the host of the nationally syndicated public radio program, Fascinating Rhythm, winner of the 1994 George Foster Peabody Award. Our musical comrades for the afternoon are to my right. We have Brenna Sage on piano, and we have Shad Olson, and of course, our very own Sarah Ellis Holiday, and they're going to be entertaining us. And I will now give the honors to our guest, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon. The next time somebody says to you that Irving Berlin could only write very simple songs, you say to them, pack up your sins. <laughs> it's a brilliant song. Absolutely brilliant. Now, it's about hell and the advantages of going there too. 1922, when jazz was new. Uh, well, it was 25 years old, but as a national music, it was first emerging. Um, when Louis Armstrong went to New York, jazz went with him, and then along came radio and uh, uh, phonograph records, and it became a national music. But the point is this. Give me a, in this song, in this song, give me a synonym for hell. Too easy. An unstated synonym for hell. New York City. <laughs> it's about, it's a song about New York. They were, all the songwriters were here. It, many of them had been raised here. Those who had not been came. And our songwriters for half a century looked out on America from the east side of the Hudson and reported on what they saw. Everything was filtered through New York. You know the famous Steinberg New Yorker cover? <laughs> That's what they saw long before Steinberg even got here. The American popular song, the classic American popular song, is a New York creature, certainly an urban creature. And New York has always been one of our music's great subjects. Now, you and I know that love songs are about, I'm sorry, that songs are about three subjects. Love, sex, and marriage. <laughs> they are, you know that, don't you? Um, they've always been about all three. Um, the sex was less direct, perhaps, than it is more recently, but it was there. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, George Gershwin and Buddy De Silva in 1924, I believe. A song called Do It Again. Ooh, do it. I promise not to sing. I'll just recite. Do it again. I should say no, 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 but do it again. If you think that's a song about eternal love, you're too young to be here. And I'm the youngest person in the crowd today, which reassures me. Today's a perfect day to be talking about love songs, and we're going to, except these are love songs for and about a city. They were written, the ones I've chosen, were written between 1882 and 1940. By which time, by the late 19th century, Tin Pan Alley, that is, can you give me a one-sentence definition of Tin Pan Alley? Everybody knows what it is, but nobody knows what it is. Can you give me a one-sentence definition of Tin? That's where it is. Are you where you get your mail? Which is still there, by the way. It's the home of popular music publishing. In America, it's where all the, and it lasts really until the talkies, because then the studios buy up all the music publishers and everything moves west. The office, there are still offices here, but the the action is in California, um, because the movies get tired of paying royalties, so they buy the publishers, then they pay royalties to themselves. Um, anyway, Tin Pan Alley has settled in the West Twenties, um, just in time just in time to record America's love affair with New York in a thousand popular songs. You know, especially if you have ever lived outside the city, that the rest of America has always had a love-hate relationship with New York, just as New York has had a love-hate relationship with the rest of America. Um, I grew up in Jersey. I never lived more than a half hour outside the city. Um, until I moved, well, except for college, I went away, but then came back. Um, and then I took a job in upstate New York, in Rochester, and I told the, the headmaster of the school that I would stay five years. 
because I could not imagine myself living without New York on my left and the Jersey Shore on my right. And I'm, unfortunately, it was a, a, it was a, a colossal failure of the imagination but, and, and of my pocketbook, uh, but I'm still there. Um, and so I've had a sense to see it in effect from, from both sides. Uh, and there is a love-hate relationship, um, except in the 20s it was a love affair. Everybody wanted to be in New York. Uh, New York became America for a while, just the opposite of what it became in the 70s when Jerry Ford said New York dropped dead, or at least on the front page of the Daily News he said it. Um, now understand that New York songs don't need to be about New York. Pack Up Your Sins never mentions New York. It's a matter, obviously, of subject matter. Sometimes you can't have a song called New York, New York that's not about. New Actually, we have two songs called New York, New York, right? <laughs> you know, start spreading the word. Don't you know it's a hell of a town? We uh, See? We have two New York. Now, can you tell me, you know who wrote the, fir the first one I mentioned? Candor and Ebb. Do you know who wrote the first one, the older one? Leonard Bernstein wrote the music. Otherwise, if you don't know who wrote the words, all you get to do is hum. Comden and Green. Comden and Green. Uh, one word, like Fred and Ginger, Comden and Green. Um, it's a matter, as, as much as it's a matter of subject, it's also a matter of sensibility. It's a way of, of looking at the world and articulating the way you look at the world. Uh, Billy Joel called it a New York frame of mind. I would call it a certain sensibility that New Yorkers possess. Um, and so I think you're going to hear as much of one today, in fact I know you are, as of the other. It's a way of looking at the world that combines the freedom, the frenzy, the decadence, and the delight of life in a great city. So here are two love songs, both from the Depression, when the urban sensibility set to music, I think, reaches its highest expression. I think the New York songs of the 30s are the greatest of all. The first one is a bittersweet song about a divorced couple still half in love. And the second one is a joyful song of eager anticipation. Thank you. 
I've been very interested by your responses. I assume you're familiar with at least some of the songs you've heard. I, I could imagine that some of you didn't know about a quarter to nine, but I find it impossible to believe that you don't all know thanks for the memory. And yet you're laughing at things you've always, you've known for 50 years. I, and, and it's not only because they're singing the well. I get the feeling you're doing something people don't often do. And if I'm right, I couldn't be more pleased. You're listening to the words. 
You're actually listening. Rather than just letting the song wash over you in a pleasant sort of abstract, warm bath kind of way, you're actually listening. What our songwriters were masterful at, these are the lyricists now, and Leo Robin is a very good example. He wrote the lyrics to Thanks for the Memory, is combining sentiment and wit in the same lyric. If you think that's easy, go try. It's easy to be witty, and it's easy to be sentimental. But wit requires res distance. Removal. You have to be able to stand back and point a finger to be witty. Sentiment requires emotional involvement. They're at odds with one another. And yet here are these mostly men, but some women, Dorothy Fields, Betty Comden, doing it with, with enormous skill and ease. They wrote these songs fast. Uh, Edgar Leslie, who wrote one of the things we're doing today, once wrote, I sometimes write lousy, but I always write fast. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Um, he wrote the words to T for Two in 10 minutes. Literally 10 minutes. Because humans was nagging him. He said, okay, I'll write a dummy lyric and fix it tomorrow. <laughs> they were going to a party. Um, and... Um, that was for uh, No No Nanette back in the mid-20s. And they ended up liking the lyric, so they never changed it. Ten minutes. Um, sometimes they get carried away. Um, when Irving Berlin wrote, I'll be loving you always, uh, George S. Kaufman, who was a, not only a great playwright and wit, but also a very sardonic man, and who did not believe in such things as true love or eternal love, said that Berlin should have written a song called I'll Be Loving You Thursday. <laughs> Do you remember what, what uh, Kaufman looked like? Very tall, homely man with long face. He was an incredible Lothario. Uh, he was a, a great lover of women, and he loved as many women as he possibly could and had an arrangement with his wife so that that was entirely acceptable. Oh yes, the two of them had, had many, many affairs. They were not, they loved each other, were not sexually attracted to one another, and so we're out there. Yeah, well, life was a summer camp. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not sure I want to pursue that line of thinking. <laughs> Great waves of foreigners begin coming to America in the years after the Civil War, from the 1870s until we get draconian immigration laws in the 1920s that pretty much closes it down. Besides, we have no more canals to dig or railroads to build. Um, obviously, they don't all come to New York, but vast numbers do. Um, they come to Boston, they come to Philadelphia, they swing around and go to Galveston, a major port of entry for immigrants. But New York was it. There's only one Ellis Island. You don't know the names of the places in the other cities where they went. But everybody in America knows what Ellis Island was. When they came, they didn't come to change America. That was not on their minds. But they did. Their attitudes, their values, their behavior, even their language and their looks, the food they ate, everything about them changed America, changed what it meant to be an American. We were no longer a blue-eyed, blonde, Anglo-Saxon country. With all that that means, good and bad, we simply weren't that anymore. It just took the blonde, white Anglo-Saxons a century to learn it, that's all. <laughs> Their arrival coincided with our becoming an urban people. We changed in about 50 years from being rural and agricultural to being urban and industrial. And there were three great migrations in the second half of the 19th century. One was the push west. It was continuing. Remember that the last of the contiguous states didn't become a state until 1912. My father was born in 1909. Well done. My, uh, my father was born in 1909. When my father was born, we didn't have 48 states. 
Now, I'm not a young man, but we're that young. We're that young. Uh, that's the first one. Second one, the children and grandchildren of the pioneers in places like Indiana and Ohio and Kentucky, because that was the frontier. The first frontier line in the first census was drawn through Albany. It's nice to know that Albany got some attention at one point or another in its history. Anyway, those people looked around and said, I'm getting out of here. Yes, but your grandfather turned the soil. I'm out of here. I'm going to New York. And all those millions of young people, mostly male, a surprising number of female, single, beginning in the 1880s, pack it up and go to New York. Look, some of them leave the farm for the village. Some of them leave the village for the bigger town. We're move, they're all moving in the same direction. You leave a, um, um, a crummy little farm and you go to Memphis. A lot of people went to Memphis. A lot of people went to New Orleans. But mainly, Americans went to New York. That's the second migration. And, of course, the coming of the Central and, uh, and, and uh, Eastern Europeans is the third. All happening at the same time. All happening at the same time. And so that ex not only coincides with our becoming urban, it accelerates our becoming urban and intensifies the kinds of changes that are going on as a result. Within a, with, I said within a half century we cease to be an Anglo-Saxon nation. By 1900, 70 percent of New Yorkers had been born somewhere else. That's an amazing statistic. We had become, by 1900, a city of migrants and immigrants. And they, these people who come soon become, from, from elsewhere, from over the seas, soon become an essential part of our American popular music. Not only because their music influences our music, but because they become the subjects of our songs. And we have thousands and thousands of songs about the Irish and the Italians and the Jews and the Greeks and the Chinese and the Japanese. There's even a song called The Argentines, the Portuguese, and the Greeks. <laughs> sung, and this is quintessential, sung by Nora Bays. How many of you know the name? Nora Bays. Okay, good for you. Nor, good for you, small, uh, we are a small remnant, but we are proud. <laughs> Nora Bays was a great star from the turn of the 20th century, on Broadway and in vaudeville. Um, she and her vaudeville, vaudevillian husband, Jack Norworth, wrote Shine on Harvest Moon. Uh, when George M. Cohan wrote over there, he said he wanted her, a, a woman, to introduce it, because she had a voice like a trumpet. It was, think Kate Smith, it was that kind of trumpet-like voice. She had that wonderful Irish name, Nora Bays, except her real name was Dora Goldberg. <laughs> By the turn of the century, it had become an advantage in the theater anyway to have an Irish name. It's all part of that same story you see. Um, as you're about to hear, the songs about the immigrants who come to New York, and all these three songs are set in New York, treat them with a combination of sentiment, sympathy, mockery, and wit. Oh. 
McNally's Row of Flats was written by um, Harrigan and Bram. Ned Harrigan is a, a major figure in our theater whose name has been largely forgotten. He's writing in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. Um, and part of what he accomplishes, or he accomplishes part of the changing view of the Irish, breaking past the stereotype. Um, and his, he wrote wonderful, wonderful lyrics and was also an actor. In the, in the plays. Um, the same character reappears in about 10 or 12 plays. His name is Mulligan. And it's the story of Mulligan's becoming accepted in America over a period of, of 20 or 25 years of plays. Sadie Salome, um, after Richard Strauss's opera, uh, this notorious, controversial um, opera, there were Salome dancers in vaudeville. Uh, they were um, for the male element. Um, you know, burlesque is, a, is, is our understanding of burlesque, burlesque as strip teasing, is relatively new. Uh, the first strip teases were only as late as the late, were only as recent as the late 20s. Um, and so for a woman on stage to show a leg, for example, before that, was, was uh, very daring. And so here's Sadie out there doing a lot of stuff. And her boyfriend obviously comes to see her and is, is outraged. Uh, and it's very funny. I'll tell you, there are two observations to make about it, I think. One is that what's so appealing about the song is that the, the tables turn. It's Sadie who is the independent one. Sadie, who is the innovative one. Sadie, who's more modern and up-to-date. And in these two young immigrants, Sadie is the one who's becoming American. And Mose wants to go back down to the Lower East Side and do whatever one did on the Lower East Side. Second part of the story. Berlin and Edgar Leslie, that's the one who said I sometimes write lousy, wrote this together. It's one of Berlin's few collaborations. They wrote it in 1910. It was only the third year of, of Berlin's career. He published his first song in 1907. They wrote it because they knew about a, a young performer out in Brooklyn in Variety, not even vaudeville, Variety, which was very coarse and, and cheap and, and vulgar. Um, and so they wrote the song for her to introduce. The night she introduced it, there was a representative from the Ziegfeld organization in the audience. And he heard her sing Sadie Salome and signed Fanny Bryce to the Ziegfeld Follies. <laughs> Regrettably, she never recorded it. So anyway, um, let's jump forward a little. That was 1910. The 1920s. Um, Two important, very important things are happening in the 20s. Harlem, as I said before, becomes the place where jazz becomes a national music. And part of that story is the importance of prohibition. Jazz finds a home in speakeasies. Um, blacks from all over the country, uh, musicians, gravitate to Harlem because their places of employment have disappeared. There are speakeasies, lots of places, but not like in New York and certainly not like in Harlem. Um, and Harlem has only been black for a very short time in the 20s. Um, it's only in the teens that it becomes black. Um, Richard Rogers was born in Harlem. His father was a, a, a German Jewish physician. Oscar Hammerstein, whose family were theatrical entrepreneurs and successful, was born in Harlem because the family lived there. It was a, 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 a German Jewish enclave uptown. And there was a real estate bust they sold off. Blacks bought, middle class blacks bought the houses and it changes almost overnight. But it is the place where this hot new music thrives and becomes obviously a defining place in the American story. Meanwhile, down in Midtown, Broadway is alive with a new kind of American musical. The American musical comedy. Um, Oklahoma is not a musical comedy. God Knows Anything by Andrew Le w Lloyd Webber is not a comedy. It's barely musical. <laughs> um, 
But the American musical comedy is invented virtually whole cloth in the mid teens, 1917. You can draw a line through it, actually, 1915, by Jerome Kern, his librettist guy Bolton, and his lyricist, who's a, an English fellow that Kern got to know when he was in England and ran into him one day in a bar in New York, didn't know he was back in the city. And he said, you want to work together? And the guy said, sure. So they wrote five or six shows together before this man said, no, uh, Jerry, I'm going back to England. Um, I've got an idea for some comic novels with characters named Worcester and... and it was P.G. Woodhouse, who would have been a major American lyricist if he had stayed with it. Do you know, perhaps his best-known song is um, Till the Clouds Roll By, do you know that one? Uh, Kern and Woodhouse. Uh, anyway, da they're, they're doing a new kind of American musical about young, urban American boys and girls. The quintessential American musical comedy character of the teens and 20s, is what you later came to love in the movies as Fred Astaire. He was the great leading man of musical comedy on the stage when the Gershwins started writing them in the 20s. He was in several of their shows. Um, innocent yet sophisticated. Uh, uh, he could chew gum in white tie and tails. <laughs> and he possessed a kind, he spoke in slang, and yet he was elegant. And he was ready at any moment to fall in love. That kind of romantic readiness. That's the character of musical comedy set in up-to-date circa 1917 or 23 or whatever, New York. Um, and so they're being written in the 20s. The songwriters, most of them either Jewish or uh, Jewish immigrants or the sons and daughters of Jewish immigrants, had mastered the double syncopation of African rhythm and American talk, the music and the lyrics. They were outsiders who could see it for what it was and then use it to get in. They wrote music that danced and seduced, and as I said before, they wrote lyrics that combined wit and sentiment in the same song. American songs helped to create the two American myths, the twin American myths of Harlem and Broadway.
Porter was prescient, wasn't he? On that? Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. And as, uh, as a, a Mets fan of long duration, I was so glad to hear about suppressing cheering <laughs> in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, when, when Tin Pan Alley songwriters write about New York or anything else, they write love songs. Um, if it, it doesn't matter what the subject of the song is, a, a Tin Pan Alley songwriter will somehow fold it in to a love song. Why? Because it's what they knew how to write. Um, if you told them to write a song about lights and ceilings, they would make it a love song that had lights and ceilings. Um, there are very few that aren't. Uh, I, was, I was trying to think of some that aren't. God Bless America isn't a conventional love song. Uh, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime is not a conventional love song. But during the 30s, there were love songs with the titles, I'm an unemployed sweetheart looking for someone to love. <laughs> uh, there, was, there was, I don't make these things up. <laughs> There was another song called, I hope I, uh, gee, I got to get a job today. It's a love song. Because if I get a job, we can be married. It's a love song. <laughs> that is, whatever's going on in the world, they somehow fold into those limits. Um, and when they wrote about New York, they wrote love songs. Again, sometimes set in the city, um, sometimes um, about the city. And what I like about the two songs that we're going to do next is that they combine the two. Because the songs love New York every bit as much as the boy and the girl in the songs love each other.
Something you should be very grateful for that you're not, that you don't always get, that you rarely get. What they are giving you is the whole song. <laughs> so people are coming to the city, but by the, the late teens and into the 20s, even though they're still coming, other people are beginning to leave. We've all, we're starting to leave before we finish coming, is what it comes down to. Wealth increases and spreads in the years after World War I. And the very rich start building mansions out on the Gold Coast, on Long Island. Where the wealthy want to go, highways and railroads follow. And where highways and railroads go, Real estate developers follow. By the 1920s, young married couples in the city have begun to move to the suburbs. Levitt did not invent the suburb. Was there an explosion in suburbia after World War II? Of course. But nothing begins when it appears to begin. It always begins before, anything big. Um, Romanticism begins, you, know, you want to pin it down, Wordsworth's Lyrical Ballad, 1792. That's when students of literature pin it down. Except Blake is writing romantic poetry 40 years earlier. What shall we make of that? Things happen before they happen. They do. Um, so by the 20s, young married couples are moving to the suburbs, and there is enough money around so that the newly affluent middle class can take a vacation. In fact, you heard a reference in Manhattan to taking a vacation. And you get now a whole body of songs about the suburbs and a whole body of songs about going on vacation. Um, you get a whole body of songs about people leaving the city not to go back to the small town but to visit and return. That is, they're no longer small town folks who live in the city, they're city people. So over those 20 years or 30 years, there's been that change in perception. The old hometown is nothing more than a memory because millions of young Americans had made a home in New York.
I get to sit down through all this. <laughs> By the way, Bungalow and Quag, um, Jerome Kern and P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, I said before that there are two kinds of New York love songs, uh, those set in the city and those about the city. And I wanted to save the ones about the city for last. Uh, these are not love songs about he and she uh, set somewhere in New York. The object of love is New York. And both of them are, in a sense, anthems. They're New York anthems. Uh, the first is a ringing fanfare to the city exactly as it is. And the second is a jubilant anticipation of return to sidewalks and streetcars and the cacophony of city life.
I must say that um, there are two songs that always get to me. One is Thanks for the Memory, and the other is Penthouse Serenade. I think they're glorious songs. Um, what's interesting about them, to me anyway, is that Bob Hope is associated with both of them, and I came to dislike him enormously as a, as a performer. Um, it dawns on me now that he is to my way of thinking, the Dick Cheney of comedy. Um, <laughs> that's good, isn't it? <laughs> um, Hard-edged, uh, rather nasty behind the quip, and a kind of wise guy out of the side of his mouth dismissal, uh, aimed at easy targets. But early hope, was, he, he really was a, a shell in the shape of a man, at least publicly. But early Hope, um, you know, Hope had rather little to do with New York. He was English by birth and spent much of his life in vaudeville touring, had some, some success in New York, which got him a Hollywood contract, and he never came back. Um, but early Hope, I assume on stage, and certainly in the very early movies, he was always the wise guy. I mean, that was part of him. That's okay. That's okay. I've been known to be a wise guy. Um, but there was something warm about him, too. Um, listening to Hope and Shirley Ross on the old record or in that dreadful old movie, Broadway Melody, of, of uh, a big broadcast of 1938, singing Thanks for the Memory. I defy you not to smile and cry at the same time. There was something genuine about hope uh, that he gave away. Um, and it's fascinating to me that these two songs that continue to move me, even though I've been listening to them for half a century, should be associated with someone I dislike so much. Um, anyway, uh, talking about movies, right from the start, 
uh, right from the start of talkies, you know, the need for material, constant need for material, and they turn almost at once to musicals. The talkies turn out not only musicals, but backstage musicals. Um, backstage musicals are wonderful for Hollywood to do because anytime they don't know what to do, they can rehearse the big number. <laughs> right? And so the songs don't need to be woven in. You can do performance numbers either as rehearsal or as performance. You know, you show an audience, you have a curtain come up, and then you have a stage that ends up being 100,000 feet deep with Carmen Miranda and 400, well, anyway. Um, so movie musicals are backstage musicals right from the start and certainly through the 30s. Betty Grable's movies in the 40s, um, a little respect for Betty Grable. She was the first movie star I fell in love with um, before I knew better. Um, no, no, she was, you know, think about it, a 10-year-old boy is going to fall in love with a, with a Betty Grable. And I did. Um, Never told my parents. The, uh, there were two kinds of musicals during those years, the 30s, those backstagers. The Astaire Rogers musicals, and in most of them, remember that Fred and Ginger were somehow connected to show business, although in one of them, Fred Astaire was a ballet dancer who knew how to tap. Uh, and the stories themselves were frothy, set in Art Deco palaces you and I will never come near. The names of those Art Deco palaces were Venice and New York, but not like any Venice or New York anyone had ever seen. But there was another kind of musical at the same time across town at Warner Brothers. Uh, they were gritty um, and they were populated by a series of unattached young women known as gold diggers. Um, in one of the early ones, um, Ginger Rogers, before Fred, played a, a character named Anytime Annie. And she, uh, someone asked one of the other gold diggers how she got the name, and the answer was she only said, one, said no once, but then she didn't hear the question. Um, um, the, the gold diggers were chorus girls. And there was a whole series of movies called The Gold Diggers Of, but they appeared in many movies not called The Gold Diggers Of. Singing and tap dancing as if their lives depended on it, because in the middle of the Depression they did. Uh, they needed jobs, desperately. Uh, but they also needed something else. They needed hope. And the hope was for stardom. And the stardom in these movies was stardom on Broadway. The place to make it was never California. The place to make it was always New York. It was just as the, the Broadway theater and New York were the pinnacles. And everything was aimed at the top. And Harry Warren and Al Dubin, Warren a New Yorker, uh, Salvatore Guaragna, Harry Warren, called himself the most famous songwriter nobody ever heard of. Um, and Dubin from Philadelphia, who used to, in the morning when he was supposed to go to high school, would take the train up from Philadelphia to New York, walk the streets, and take the train back. Uh, he was a New Yorker by sensibility, if not by accident of birth. Um, Harry Warren from Brooklyn and Dubin gave them an anthem the Gold Diggers, an anthem worthy of their moxie. They had drive, and they had toughness, and they had a, a quality I prize above almost all others, irreverence. Um, they were American kids, but even more important, they were New York kids on the make, on the way up, or so they dreamed. Thank you for coming.
Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>